So I'll go ahead and get started. So what, what we're talking about today is production machine learning and really trying to understand the motivation uh, for doing production and the requirements and some of the processes. So uh, let me get started here. Um, we start really with the world because um, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to model something out in the world. It's it's a, an event or process uh, or a situation. Uh, it's it's something that we're trying to then predict later on. Um, okay. So we measure the things that we can measure. Um, and that becomes the data that we're going to give to our model. It's also the same thing that we as humans do when we're trying to understand the world or make predictions about things that will happen uh, or trying to understand something uh, in the current reality given data that we can collect. So it's very much like what humans do. And if we're working um, in an academic setting or if we're just beginning to work with our model, then we're probably going to start in something like a notebook or maybe an IDE and, and do a lot of experimentation and iteration with our data and our, and our model architecture and really try to understand how well we can predict uh, given the data that we have and, and look for ways to try to improve our model. And if we're in a research setting, um, we're probably just going to take that result when, once we get to a good place and publish a paper based on that, uh, and then we're done. So in a research setting, this, this would be sort of the, the end of the journey here. But if we're in a production setting, that's really just the beginning of the journey because now we have a model, but we're gonna use that in a product or service. So we need to think about all the other parts that are required to, to use that in a product or service. And it's not obviously a research paper. Um, so that gets us to production machine learning. And, and what are, what's the difference really between that and like a research or, or academic setting? So we have all the normal things that we need in any machine learning development. We're probably gonna need labeled data um, because we're probably doing supervised learning. We might not be, there's other, other types. Um, we wanna make sure that that data covers the same feature space as the prediction requests that we're gonna be getting. We wanna to try to make it as efficient as possible. So we're gonna do things like try to minimize the dimensionality and maximize the predictive data in our training data set. Um, we need to consider things like fairness as well because we're gonna be serving some, or, you know, we're well, it depends actually, but we're probably going to be serving users of some kind. So uh, we want to make sure that we're we're serving them fairly, and also consider different subsets of users well. So the example I usually give here is, uh, you know, we want to make sure we're serving uh, people in uh, uh, the C-suite as well as we're serving, you know, the basic uh, basic users. Uh, we also want to consider rare conditions in a lot of cases. So. For example, autonomous vehicles, uh, rare conditions can be incredibly important uh, to main, maintain safety of that vehicle. But again, they're rare, so uh, it, unless we, you know, make sure that we're considering those, it can be an issue. Um, but overall, the data and model life cycle becomes incredibly important in a production setting, and we'll we'll understand that a little bit better in a second. But along with all of that. We have all of the things that we have for any uh, software deployment because we're going to be deploying software into a production deployment. So we need to make sure it's scalable. We need to make sure that we've written it to be extensible, that we're managing our configuration, that it's consistent and reproducible. Uh, we want to make sure we've designed in a modular fashion. We want to make sure we've, we've followed best practices and testability. Testability is uh, a different kind of animal in, in machine learning than it is in just normal software development. And we want to make sure that we're monitoring and monitoring is also an interesting thing, especially in a supervised setting to try to understand the performance of our model. Uh, and safety and security, there are attacks that can happen against models. So we want to make sure we've taken those into account 
and done what we can to protect protect against them. So all of that is, uh, you know, kind of daunting. There's a lot there to try to cover. Um, and so that's really been the genesis of MLOps. And MLOps is an emerging field, and there's different uh, definitions for it. Um, but this is a pretty good one. Um, and in general, they all say pretty much this, what, what this says. It's, it's a version of DevOps that is specifically focused towards machine learning. So things like automation and monitoring are, are very important uh, in this setting. And we'll, we'll talk a lot about what that means. So if we look at, um, at a comparison with DevOps, um, continuous integration is, is a, a key component here, but for machine learning, it also involves testing and validating the data that we're gonna give to our model, this, including the schemas for that, and the models themselves. Um, the continuous deployment is, is different as well because we're gonna be deploying a trained model from a pipeline into a, some sort of an inference uh, infrastructure. Um, and there's a whole pipeline um, uh, behind that, that that has to be uh, maintainable continuously for retraining. So the retraining part is actually something that's unique to DevOps, to, to MLOps rather than, than DevOps. We're gonna be, in, in most cases, it really depends. I mean, there are some domains where things really don't change that much. But in most cases, we're gonna be doing uh, retraining of our model on some sort of a cadence. And trying to understand what that cadence should be is, is um, a question in itself, and there's different ways to do that. So where people start out normally is a manual process. Um, and at some scale that works fine, um, but it, it, essentially you're trying to cover all the bases and you're triggering things manually. So you have uh, an experimentation uh, side of things uh, with some, some manual steps uh, that, that are done to, to create a trained model that's deployed into some sort of registry, even if it's just a, a directory on a server somewhere. Um, and then we're gonna serve it to some sort of prediction service. So, but why isn't one model good enough? In other words, why do we need to consider retraining for our model? Well, let's take a look at that. To do that, we're gonna do a thought experiment and we're going to imagine that we are an online retailer selling shoes and we're using the click-through rate um, from our website to uh, help us predict how much inventory we need to order. And that's, that's a reasonable approach that gives us a signal about what people are interested in. Um, but suddenly uh, we discover that our, our area under the curve, our AUC and prediction accuracy have dropped and, and not across all of our inventory, but on a particular slice, particular part of our inventory, men's dress shoes in this case. Well, the question is why? Why did it drop? It was doing fine before, and you know now we have a problem. And probably more importantly is how do we know uh, that we have a problem? How can we monitor and catch that before it becomes a big problem? Well, unfortunately, it's often the case for spe people, especially when they're first starting out, uh, that they discover these things too late and they either order way too much inventory or not enough uh, or whatever the, the use for their model is uh, and they discover the hard way and it's a problem. So that gets back to why, why was it a problem in the first place and the reason for that is change. So just like with humans, um, the world changes and we need to understand those changes and adapt. Your machine learning model is exactly the same. It is trained on a slice of the world, a point in time when you gathered your training data. And if you didn't retrain that model on new data, it didn't track the changes in the world. And so at some point the world has changed too much and your model is no longer accurately predicting the current reality. 
So that gets us to production machine learning. And one of the, the, the main issues around that is understanding your data and understanding the world around your data, including changes to your business, like moving into new geographies or launching new product lines. All of that affects your model. When we think about our model, we, we normally think about, well, the model. <laughs> so we're focused usually on the modeling code and the data behind that. And that's, of course, very important. But when we moved in, into a production setting, we discover that there's actually a lot more than just the model that we need to consider. And at Google, we've measured the modeling code to be something like 5% of the code necessary to deploy a typical machine learning product or service. There's, there's a, a whole lot of other infrastructure and, and software framework that needs to be wrapped around that model in order to be successful in a production setting. So again, uh, people have discovered this the hard way. Um, and uh, it's uh, this is a kind of a now famous tweet. They, they had their model in three weeks and 11 months later, it's still not deployed. And many people have run into this. This is a kind of a landmark paper that was written way back in 2015, but it's still, I mean, seven years ago, and it's still very valid. It, if you haven't read it, I, I strongly encourage it because it really dives into a lot of these issues. Um, so we've got all these things. We've got all these uh, issues and, and areas that we need to focus on. What now? Well, um, there's there's a, a higher level of of ML ops that that you can uh, eventually, and it, it it takes some work to get there, but you can move up to an ML ops level one where you're using pipelines and automation, and that starts with an experimentation framework where you're using a pipeline to to really iterate on your model and your data and and work towards a workable model that's uh, going to be either the first deployment or uh, a, you know an upgraded version of your model. There's also the production side of things. This is more around retraining a current model with newly collected data. Um, so and of course with the serving side of this as well. So you're this is where you're serving in in a production environment to whatever application you're running. Now, serving could mean running on a server that is in a data center or in the cloud, or it could mean running in a mobile application where you're loading the model into the, the mobile app uh, or in a web browser uh, where you're loading the model into a web browser. Um, the pipeline portion of this is really the, the heart of what you're doing here. So both in experimentation and in production, the pipeline is, is incredibly important. Um, and that gets us to TFX or TensorFlow Extended, which is the model, which is the, the pipeline framework that is used at Google for the vast majority of our uh, uh, products and services that use uh, machine learning. So you've You've probably used uh, TFX today or used products that use TFX. Um, and if you've used any of these, uh, these things like, uh, you know, meat, well, well, actually we're using, using meat right now. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see here. This is kind of a high level view of TFX. The things up here in gray are tasks. So if you think about the tasks that need to be performed to train a model, you start with ingesting your data, uh, you go through some feature engineering and stuff, you train the model, and then eventually you serve the model. In the middle here are libraries. These are open source libraries that are used uh, within TFX, but they're also, you can, you can use them by themselves. So if you wanna dive into particular parts of this task flow, you can just work with those individual libraries. But those are leveraged by these things in orange down below, which are TFX components. These are just the standard components that start when you do a pip install. 
So this is what you start with for your first pipeline, but then you build on this by creating your own components. And we'll talk in a little bit about how to do that. This is a different look at uh, a TFX pipeline. The components here in orange are a training pipeline and the components in green are an inference pipeline. And both of these use Apache Beam. So example gen, for example, uh, actually most of these components, trainer doesn't, but most of these components use Apache Beam to perform the, the processing that they're going to do. And bulk inference here runs that inference again on beam using the run inference operator um, so there's a there's a close relationship that we'll talk in a second about between tfx and and apache beam there's also the metadata store that is uh kind of backing all of this and stores all the artifacts that are produced when you run your training pipelines and we'll talk about that a little bit too so Let's dive into, first of all, what is a TFX component? There are three parts to it, a driver, executor, and publisher. Um, in, in the vast majority of cases, you never have to change the driver and publisher. So it's really in the executor. And in fact, in, in many cases, you don't even see the driver and publisher. The driver reads in your data and the publisher writes out your data. The executor is where the work of your component is done. And this is all backed in the metadata. So a component will read input artifacts from metadata. It'll do its thing based on its configuration and, and uh, in many cases, user code. Um, and then it'll write out its results back into metadata. So that happens over input and output channels, which are, are just convenience classes that are, are used to, to uh, make that easier to do. And that's how data flows through a pipeline. It, an upstream component writes a result in a metadata, and then you have downstream components that depend on that result. So when that's available, they start up and you have a data dependency here. This all has to be orchestrated. So there's a, a number of orchestrators that are available. And one of the key things about TFX and, and actually Apache Beam as well is that it, they, they run just about anywhere. And that by itself is very, very powerful. So you can run the whole thing in a web browser without installing anything on your system just by running in a collab and it's free. You can run it on your laptop, which I do a lot. You can run it in a Kubernetes cluster. You can run it in a managed service with Vertex AI. You can orchestrate using just pure Python, like in a notebook. You can orchestrate with Apache Airflow uh, or, in, or in Kubeflow. And for processing, it can all happen on your, on your laptop or, or in a Colab VM uh, by using the direct runner from, from Beam. Uh, or you can use a Spark runner or a Flink runner or a Dataflow runner to do that processing in Beam. So you, you guys are familiar with the power that that gives you. Orchestrating in a notebook is a great way to do your development. So this gives you uh, the ability to, to iterate on each of your individual steps in the, in the pipeline and your components and work with your data. And, and you know, it, it's, a, it's a nice convenient way. It's not the best debugging in terms of debugging tooling. Um, there is some, there's PDB of course, um, but overall, it's a great way to, to do development of your pipeline. The metadata store, we just, we've discussed, backs all of this. So we're going to go through this, uh, and I'm trying to get through this quickly because I, I don't want to delay Reza here on the next one. But um, the artifacts that are kept in the metadata store, uh, there's different kinds. And, and in fact, you can create your own artifact types. Trained models, for example, are an artifact and they have properties. Data sets are an artifact, and they have properties. Those artifacts are grouped so that it makes querying in the metadata store uh, much more powerful. So an execution run, for example, is a, uh, a relationship between artifacts. One of the things that allows you to do is to understand the provenance across 
artifacts. So if I have a trained model, what were the, uh, the what was the data set that was used to train that model? And what were the uh, metrics that uh, when I ran evaluation on the that model, what 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 did it uh, uh, what did it give me and, and so forth. So that becomes important, especially when you're trying to do audits uh, for legal or regulatory requirements. Apache Beam. So I think you guys are all familiar with Apache Beam. Um, it, you already know this. Uh, at least I hope you do. We're using the Python uh, SDK uh, for for Beam. Um, although you can also run using other SDKs in containers. One of the things you can do is put a TFX component into a container. So for Apache Beam, you've got all these. Uh, uh, you know, native uh, uh, frameworks running clusters. You've got all the SDKs. Beam sits in the middle. We create uh, operations and, and uh, well, P collections and P transforms. Uh, it gets sent to the, the target and then we uh, create a result. Um, in terms of how TFX looks at this, we have a TFX component and really the executor is a part that's going to be working with Beam. And that's running either in a full OS or in a Docker container. So if it's running in a Docker container, that could be working with any of the Beam SDKs. If it's running in a full OS, it's probably running Python. So Beam sits there, we create a Beam pipeline, it does its thing, we get a result, and it's sent back to the TFX component. So that's how TFX components work with Beam to, to run their processing. Okay, so I mentioned earlier there are some standard components that come when you do a pip install. Uh, again, this is what a pipeline looks like, and these are the standard components that you get. Uh, so let's take a quick look at those. There's example gen, which is used to ingest your data. It uses Beam to do that. There's a number of formats that you can ingest, uh, both file formats and through queries. Um, and a number of those are, are supported using Beam. One of the things it does is to split your data into, uh, well, at least training and eval splits, but you can specify as many as you need. And it also groups it into spans. So you can have large amounts of data that are grouped into spans and separated, um, which allows the processing to, to happen much better. Um, we then have statistics gen, which makes a full pass over your data, again using Beam, and generates basic, you know, descriptive statistics like, uh, well, accounts of the values and the numbers that are missing, the mean, the standard deviation, the min, max, median, all that stuff. And there's some nice visualization that is available in a notebook to help you work with and understand your data. Then we have schema gen, which uses the result from statistics gen, does not in this case use Apache Beam. Um, but it's really looking to try to just understand the schema of your data. What, what are your data types? And for categorical variables, what are the valid values for those categories, which are referred to as the domain? And also for features that can have multiple values, like an array, it, we, that's referred to as valency. So um, is it single or multiple valence? Um, and then presence is whether it's optional or required. Example validator takes those statistics and schema and just looks for problems. Um, so it's you know fairly basic, but again, you're running in an automated framework. So uh, when you're running this and no one's watching, you wanna try to catch things. Then there's transform. If you're using TensorFlow, then transform is a great tool. Well, it's a great tool anyway, but it has specific advantages for, for TensorFlow that we'll talk about in a second. Again, it's using Apache Beam. And what transform is all about is transforming your data. It's feature engineering. So it's doing things like, uh, you know, creating dictionaries or doing normalization or, scaling to z-scores you see here 
it's all the things you do in, in normal feature engineering. And if you're using TensorFlow, one of the things that it does is produce a pre-processing graph. That is the result of your analysis. So things like your mean that are really going to be a constant over your data get converted into constant tensors. And then operations remain as operations, but they use those constants. That then gets used when both you're training your model and when you're serving your model. It gets prepended to your model. So what that does is it, it eliminates the possibility of training serving skew, which can happen if you have two different code paths between training and serving that may or may not be doing exactly the same thing. It's certainly possible to have them do the same thing and you not and, you know and not have a problem. But there's always a potential there that you could. So to just eliminate that potential and it's one less thing to worry about. Um, a, a, the transform pre-processing graph uh, is a great tool to have. Then we get to trainer, which trains your model. And trainer can work with a number of different formats, uh, including TensorFlow, but also including things like Scikit-Learn uh, and XGBoost and PyTorch, or really just about any Python framework for the trainer component that comes with TFX. Or if you're training your model in a container, then you can pretty much write your own uh, training component. So if you want to use like DL4J or whatever, it's, it's possible to do that as well. There are advantages to using TensorFlow. Uh, so it, it is, you know, sort of a favored, favored format. One of the things is using TensorBoard uh, to really understand and analyze your model performance. And one of the nice things about that is because we have previous versions of our model in metadata, maybe from six months ago, we can do a comparison between the model that we just trained and the model that we trained previously to understand how things change. Then we have tuner, which is used for hyperparameter tuning. Pretty straightforward. Uh, it, it's, uh, you know, it's hyperparameter tuning. Uh, and then we have evaluator. Now, evaluator evaluates your model performance, but it does it on a deep level. And it's using Apache Beam for the processing. So, um, what I mean by deep level is you're defining slices of your data, and this is important for things like fairness and rare conditions. And then it's looking at performance on each of those individual slices. So we have some visualization tools to help you look at that. Knowing which slices to slice really depends on your knowledge of the thing that you're doing, your domain knowledge. So that's important and it's part of, you know, being a machine learning engineer. But this is a great set of tooling to really help you do that analysis and understand situations where you have performance that isn't really what you want it to be. Then we have InfraValidator. InfraValidator is, again, we're in a production setting. We want to make sure that when we deploy our model, it will actually run on our, our production uh, infrastructure. So InfraValidator helps us do that. It, it, it tests uh, loading and running our model to make sure that it will do that. If all of that stuff passes, and if the model that you just trained is, uh, performs better than the model that you currently have in production, then Pusher will push it to a deployment target, like serving or TensorFlow Lite or TensorFlow JS wherever you're going to end up using that model. Bulk Infer uh, again uses Beam, and it's going to use the run inference uh, operator to do inference on a batch of data. So when you're not running in an online setting, Bulk Infer is a great tool to have. OK, there are also pipeline nodes, which are specifically focused towards the metadata. So it's pulling artifacts from metadata and doing the queries into metadata to get the artifacts that you need. 
So for example, there's an importer node. People often use this to pull a schema that has previously been generated rather than generating a new one and using that in the pipeline. There's resolver as well. People often use resolver uh, and it's really typically used to, to uh, pull the, the previously trained model, the, la the model that's currently in production, pull that from the metadata store so I can do that comparison. And there's two different kinds of, of resolver currently, although you're, you can create your own. Uh, the latest artifacts, which is more general, and the latest blessed model, which is specifically focused towards that, that blessed model query. But a lot of what you do is custom. So you're going to be using custom components. And there's really three ways to create a custom component. The easiest way is with a Python function that you just add a decorator and annotations to use. And then, as I've also mentioned, you can create a container that runs whatever you need to run in the container and all you have to do is make sure that it maintains a contract for the input and output output from that container so that it works as a component in a pipeline um, you can also work in more of a pythonic fashion by extending classes so there's a number of classes that are used to create components you can extend the the, the uh, existing uh, components that we just talked about to create your own, like if you're going to create your own example gen, for, ex for example, you can, you can do that extension. And when you do it, you create a custom component that just fits in your pipeline just like any other component. There's, there's no difference there in the way that it operates or the way that it interacts with metadata. So for a Python function-based component, this is the easiest way to do it. This is always where I start unless I absolutely need more than this. Um, and you just add a decorator and these uh, annotations on the, the parameters and then your code and you're, you're done. For a container-based component, if you're familiar with Docker files, this will look very similar. So there is a wrapper function that you use. Oh, but uh, oh, let me go back. Uh, a wrapper function that's used to wrap up your container. Um, and then you have similar kinds of, of, uh, art of, uh, of annotations for the, the parameters. There's an image that you're going to start from, and then you're going to add layers to that. There's a, a command that you're going to run to start up your, uh, your component in your container, very similar to a, a, a Docker file. So, one of the things that's happening out there is there's this, this big community of people who are building custom components and tools and libraries. So before you build your own, uh, you should probably check out the group and see if someone else has already built it. Uh, but if you do end up building your own, uh, we encourage you to, to uh, join the group and, and contribute back to the community so that we can uh, you know, all work together and avoid reinventing the wheel. So, for example, one of the things that the community has built is an evaluator that's focused on evaluating XGBoost models. Uh, so if you're working in XGBoost, this, this helps you with doing the evaluation step and that, that data slicing that we talked about uh, running with XGBoost. Another one that's coming out uh, really soon, it, it's, uh, I don't think we've done the release yet, but we're very close. Uh, is to read from a Feast feature store. So this allows you to ingest your data from the feature store into your pipeline. There's also, if you're just getting started with production ML, there's a four course series. Uh, it's a specialization that we created on Coursera with Andrew Ng. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's a great way to come up to speed on really the whole field, not just TFX, but the whole field of production ML. Um, so that's TFX. Uh, again, there's standard components that will get you started. And it, it's a good way to just, you know, get started on doing TFX development. You can run in a, a variety of different uh, execution environments and different orchestrators and so forth. And as you grow, you can extend that with your own custom components. 
And so we come back to the world and really what we've done is we've gone out, we've gotten our data, we've tried to understand the world, we've brought it back and we've applied a bunch of tooling to make that into a product or service that you know serves our customers or our business needs and and, and you know we've gotten through and we're we're doing production ML. And if you'd like to know more, there's our uh, website here. It's tensorflow.org slash TFX. And here's some more links uh, to, to get you started. There's our repo. There's a bunch of YouTube videos. And, and we have a special interest group and community. And that's my talk. And I'm, wow, I, I'm almost on time here. I, I, do we have time for questions at all? Or? Uh, yes, yes, we do. And well, we had one from Baibab Sahu, but he says it's already been answered, but I'll just read it for everybody. What is the relation between TFX and Kubeflow? But Baibab says that that's already been cleared out. Okay, just to, to review. So the, the relation between TFX and Kubeflow, TFX runs on a number of different execution environments. Uh, including just you know on your laptop. Uh, but one of those is it runs on Kubeflow. So if we're running in a containerized environment, usually that's Kubeflow. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have thanks from Fernando and from Rafael. I don't know if we have any other questions. The slides are, are in the BIM College repo so that you can also check the, the links and resources that Robert has shared um let's we have a raised hand from Baibab Sahu. Baibab, okay. you you want to enable your yeah. microphone yeah sure yeah. go ahead sorry uh robert i just want to uh, like ask this thing uh kubeflow also is kind of uh uh mlops engine right it works in kubernetes and it also has component you can do hard uh you, you can do tuning you can do uh experiments metadata everything is there so what we see on DFX and what I see on Kubeflow, both kind of are kind of quite similar. Both are solving the same problem. So what is DFX actually giving extra? Yeah. Um, so in in some sense, you can, I mean you can use either. So you can use it's called Kubeflow pipelines. It's a, a sub project within Kubeflow. Um, to do very similar types of things that we've just looked at in, in TFX. Um, a lot of a lot of times really is a matter of, of which approach you're more comfortable with because TFX takes a more Pythonic and, and ML centric approach. Kubeflow pipelines is uh, closer to a Kubeflow or uh, Docker style it's more configuration driven uh, uh, approach. Um, so, you know, I, I think as a developer, it's really which one you choose is, is a lot like a lot of other choices of frameworks. It's, it's the one that sort of um, seems to appeal to you more just in terms of, of uh, the style of, of development. Um, I can tell you though, at at, at Google, uh, I mean, uh, we pretty much use TFX. We I don't, I'm not aware of anyone using uh, KFP for for any production workflows, but the, but they could. I mean, that's it's possible. Mm -hmm.